Um, in case you haven't seen it, there's refreshments and coffee over here. Um, my name is Christian Lightheart. Uh, I, I, was, I bugged Jared to get this uh, colloquium started and then bailed on him last year. Uh, so I, I wasn't here. So you guys are all veterans and I'm the newbie. Um, but I just wanted to welcome you all. I don't have a lot to say. I'm going to be listening. Um, but uh, I just wanted to give you a few uh, things to, uh, to think about. One is um, just the, the schedule. We'll have three speakers before lunch and then two after lunch. Um, that will be today and tomorrow. And I think Bach lectures, Jared, are happening tonight and tomorrow night. And they're both at 6.30, 6.30. So if you are interested in attending more musical lectures, those will be here. There is a projector screen if you uh, speakers want to make use of it. The plug is right here. It's also a piano. Feel free to migrate over there. But can I open us with prayer? I'm going to do that. We're God in heaven. <clears throat> Thank you for giving us the ability to sing, to reflect who you are in song. Father, I pray that you would give us the uh, both the levity and the seriousness that we need to improve at this amazing skill. Father, I pray that you'd be with all the speakers who are presenting over the next two days, that you would give them wisdom, that you would make their words pierce our hearts so that we are changed, um, so that we can react and respond, and that this would truly be a colloquium that will build uh, each of us up uh, in our own unique ways. Father, we thank you for all of your gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, I think Pastor Yuri may not need any introduction. Um, so <laughs> he has a schedule to keep to, so I'm going to let him just come on up here. Thanks, man. Appreciate it, brother. Woohoo! Well, thank you once again for the invitation to be here among you. Uh, undoubtedly, last year was the most memorable conference that I've ever spoken at <laughs> in my entire life. <laughs> most memorable. Uh, who knew that a virus could stir more music in the church and give be the, uh, the genesis of a revival of liturgical education. It's amazing. What the Wuhan lab meant for evil, God meant for good. <laughs> what I want to do in this talk is develop a context for singing that is generally overlooked by uh, musicians in, in the church today, certainly, one which I think to need, needs to be a fundamental aspect of why we are to raise our voices unto our God. And I'm referring to the unique element of play in theology, the unique element of play in theology. Uh, one aspect of my doctoral dissertation was on the leisure practices in the theology of Luther and the New England Puritans. And there was so much, as any dissertation, there's so much you want to add, but uh, you know, uh, when a dissertation ends, a psalm tap lecture begins. <laughs> so here I am. Uh, my focus will be on the theological framework of Luther's theology of play, and then at the end I want to make some applications uh, that I think are significant as from the vantage point of a pastor who loves to sing. Uh, Luther's life is a very compelling life in all sorts of ways that you would expect from a theologian and the kind of reformer pioneer at, that he was. But perhaps what is less known is the theology of Luther, in the theology of Luther is how play influence Luther's moral reforms in the 16th century. Fundamentally, in my estimation, Luther's Reformation was a departure from a particular kind of God. Luther's Reformation was a departure from a mechanical God who communicated with his people only through priestly rituals and superstitions. But for the German reformer, God was very different than that. For the German reformer, God is a God who plays games with his people, Deus Ludens. In his table talk, Luther notes that the only way to reconcile a God who punishes sin and yet provides the greatest liberty for his children is by understanding God in his childlike nature, in his childlike nature. He further notes that God is friendlier to us than those who are nearest to us that he himself is always willing to engage us in our most profound need, which culminated in the sending of Jesus. And for Luther, the purpose of Jesus' incarnation was that we may look to him as our best. We may look to him as our best. Uh, when Luther was only a youth, he remembers how the church of the day condemned all sorts of very basic entertainment. For Luther, he writes that the makers of cards and the musicians of his day, especially the musicians at dances, 
we're not allowed to admit the sacraments. We're, we're not admitted to the sacraments at all. Imagine Nancy Pelosi would be today. <laughs> Luther was raised in what he refers to as an anti-play culture. He decried the restraints of the day, and as a result, he made a point to employ playful language and metaphors in his theological discourse. In his disputation with Erasmus over free will, this shows up quite a bit, where Luther accuses Erasmus of playing a childish game of hide-and-seek. He accuses the other theologians of the day of playing a game of blind man's bluff. Luther charged his opponents with playing games while ultimately fooling themselves into thinking that while they were doing ecclesiastical things, they were fooling themselves into thinking that they were invested in God's game. But for Luther... The Christian life was indeed playful, but we needed to enter into God's playfulness to establish models for human communion and life. So in turn, a proper theology of God as a playful father would affect husbands in the church, earthly fathers, and most certainly in his day, the clergymen, as well as the theological disputations of the day. Now this all seems to me, as I've been reading much of Luther, that despite Luther's pugilistic form, we should view him more as someone who tried to rid the church of false games, that Luther's role was to rid the church of false games in order to restructure God's playground according to the scriptures. In Luther's theology, those who took away play failed to understand God's revelation to his children. For Luther, the church of the day was the kind of church that took away all the joy of worship because they were no longer interested in God's playfulness, but they were only interested in rigid games directed solely by sour clergy. Music lost its vigor because for Luther, it was left to a group of professionals who themselves lost the pleasure of leading and singing. A one-sided church where the people watch as spectators is to nullify the communion of the persons of the Godhead, and it is certainly to make null the Christ-bride relationship in the act of worship. The Reformer underscores this divine human relationship when he describes God again and again as the one who plays games with human beings. For Luther, God is not just free, but radically free to be with his children in playfulness. And this playfulness between the triune God and his people ought to be directly applied to the relationship between the clergy and the people in the divine service. That is, for Luther, God sets the, play, the background music for God's children to play, and the best way to play in Luther's theology is to respond to God's goodness in song. And so as we consider the theme of God's playfulness, what is interesting in my studies is that there's very little development of this in the patristics and classical literature, and no example that I'm aware of of any developed biblical theology of a god of play in their writings either. But the Reformation came along and perforated this anti-play motif as Luther developed his theology. And in defense of play, Luther had an arsenal of biblical rationales, but one of the most interesting ones he sought out was a translation of the Vulgate from Proverbs chapter 8, where the Latin ludens for play or game appears to describe the relationship between wisdom and the world. So that for Luther, the world that God created is this interplay between a playful God and exuberant children eager to taste and see that the Lord is good. In Luther, God plays with us so that we may enter into a deeper faith and trust in him. Those who did not, those who refuse to enter into God's playfulness are therefore living independent of God himself. And this was applied not only to Luther's view of worship, but this was applied also to his uh, very profound ministry of Christian counseling, which Bob Kellerman uh, dealt with in his recent book on Lutheran counseling. When counseling a man who was deeply distressed, filled with sadness over all sorts of things that were ailed him, Luther suggests, young man, God is not a God of sadness. He is a God of joy. But he says, the devil, however, he is the embodiment of sadness and death. The Lord wishes to end the devil's arrogance, Luther says, by cheering your heart with his word. 
So Luther views the Christian life in very playful categories. But it's not some trivial and flippant kind of play. For Luther, the Christian plays even in his struggle for happiness, much like Jacob's wrestling with God. So that the downcast man ought not to choose solitude as an answer to his sadness, but Luther always would thrust the sad man, the sad individual, into a community of fellowship and joy. The Christian finds his consummate joy in the church where Christ gathers his people around word and sacraments and ministers to them in joy. God does not play without means. God is not a God who plays only from above. He enters into our world and he uses his means, his secondary means. And for Luther, primarily, the scriptures are God's means for God's play. He writes this in his table talk. The holy word brought near to the people in their tongue was not just the introduction of words in readable format, in accessible format. For Luther, translating the Bible into their own tongue was the introduction of a new culture of play that distanced the church from the dualistic philosophy of the Middle Ages. Luther did not, as you all know, he did not continue in the tradition that minimized the working person or that put the working person at a separate category from the clergy or the monk. All of life was religious and had tremendous implication for those working within the church and also outside. And among the many implications of this equality, the equality, let's just say, to use Luther's language, between clergy and cobbler, was that work outside of regular hours, outside of established working hours, work outside of those hours, was to be creatively used for Luther to honor and glorify God. And so Luther, in contrast, if you've read anything of Joseph Pieper, in contrast to Joseph Pieper, did not only view leisure in terms of contemplation and meditation, Luther brought, from my perspective, a holistic approach to the Christian life, asserting that leisure and play have an essential role in preventing work from becoming an idol. So for Luther, there were many people who worked themselves into death, but leisure and play were those things which kept people from turning work into an idol. In the letter he writes to Melanchthon, he observes that rest, that when we rest, he says, we worship God since when we are resting, we are placing all our cares upon him and giving thanks for him for the strength that he has given us to work. So Luther continually, in his writings, fought against the duality observed in his day between those who do work in the church and those outside. Both had merit, and both were playful exercises unto the Lord. And so as Luther develops his theology of the Incarnation, obviously he elevates the centrality of the Word made flesh of Jesus Christ as the solution to the duality that was implicit in previous centuries. The common man comes out of bondage of superstition and relics, and they find ultimate rest in the person of Jesus Christ. God plays best with his creation when he sends his son to earth to provide a human example of intimacy between man and God. Jesus enters the world as a friend to sinners. He enters the world as a friend to those who seek him, but his presence is continually, as we read the gospel narratives, continually unfriendly towards those who refuse to understand the playfulness of God. And in the ministry of Jesus, we see various examples of this, of course. We begin to see the playfulness of God in human flesh when Messiah Jesus engages his disciples playfully with the use of words, in the singing of psalms, in the partaking of foods, in the food, and even when he speaks hard words to them. Even when Christ speaks hard words to his disciples, they are in the context of the seriousness of his goodwill or good playfulness towards them, Luther says. Luther frequently puts the human relationship to God in the context always of a tender father and a child. And the application, of course, is especially salient in the communion between Jesus and his disciples through the gospel narratives. Jesus continually asks the disciples questions beyond their comprehension as if in a fatherly game to draw the disciples nearer to his word. So Luther concludes that God indeed plays with us like a father with his little children. He dandles us and cuffs us. And incidentally, I think for us here, I think this is a 
part of the case that we must make for a theologically rich hymnody in our congregations. Good hymnody is something you grow into rather than something you find yourself fully conscientious at the time of singing. God plays with us through his musical grammar and we grow into the language the more we practice it. I was speaking at a church in California this past week and I was making a very similar point and a young lady approached me after the service and she said, you know, I always thought that music was something that we were to grasp and use as a means of worship immediately, that we are to have this ultimate knowledge of whatever we sing and now you've taught me that I have to grow into this thing. And for her, that was kind of a revelation. We grow into musical knowledge. But for Luther, it's always important to note here, sometimes we tend to think very theoretically here, for Luther, the emergence of play was not some theoretical language, but it was very personal in his own life. There was no theological substance that Luther penned that was not applied to his life and ministry in some form. Luther was uh, the ultimate applicant to his own theology. The language of God's play was a hermeneutical tool. The language of God's play was a hermeneutical tool for Luther to console the suffering and to show <clears throat> God's care for his own. This is really part of my interest in studying Luther's theology of play in the area of Christian counseling. Luther painted a portrait of suffering in his pastoral care in, on two levels. The first level was the suffering that we experience from, from outside, right? illness, persecution, rejection, death, and so on. The second level of suffering related to the trial of faith experienced through earthly temptations, the, the temptations that came to us, that we fall into, that we struggle to fight against. Those, that's the second kind of suffering for Luther. So Luther viewed God's divine counsel frequently at war with Satan and his strategies, which thrust Luther's pastoral counsel always, almost, immediately, frequently, certainly, at all times and all places, at war with Satan. For Luther, counseling was always done in the realm of religious warfare. It was never something quietly to be done. Any kind of pastoral counseling was already in the realm of religious warfare. Any kind of pastoral counseling, whether at the first level of care, things that happened from the outside or things that happened from within the temptations, were already in the realm of religious warfare and the counselee's role was to see that they were in war against the devil and Luther's role was to make it abundantly clear that they were there already. It's impossible to read Luther and not view his life as both spiritually and physically at war with Satan. And so, which for Luther, which is very interesting, for Luther, his entire pastoral ministry was a ministry of changing the sufferer's perspective. He wouldn't give you a list of 10 things to try here, 10 things you ought to do by next week. For Luther, the suffering servant needed to reorient his life by interpreting his pain rightly. So what he believed is that many of us had a view of pain that was distorted. And so Luther would reorient their lives by helping them to see their pain rightly. And for, for Luther, this meant, of course, that the sufferer needed to find a, a motivation, joy, and a certain playfulness so that he would desire the presence of God, Coram Deo, that he would desire to be in God's presence because Luther understood God to play near his children. That if you want the blessings, the gifts, the service of God, children needed to find the grace of God sufficient so that they would be drawn daily to his fatherly presence. For Luther, there was such uh, an orphan theology among sufferers that they never truly understood that they had a tender father who was always eager to care and to shepherd them through their ailments. And of course, Luther's pastoral theology comes from his own various ailments. Among them, what Luther writes was the common recurrence of uh, depression, which led to all sorts of other physical problems in his own life. He believed, however, contrary to many, that his depressions, his weariness, his spiritual warfare were a necessary part of his fight for the faith that needed to be fought head-on in battle against evil. Luther never shied. He, he viewed suffering as a means by which we come to know God fully and that we come to play in God's playground more consistently because he knew that in the playground itself were serpents eager to excommunicate him from the joy that God gives. He often said that music was the tool that God used to comfort his soul. For Luther, there was certainly a gravity to life 
But the gravity of life did not mean that we respond through su to suffering through morose measures, but rather even our war against the devil was to be a playful exercise, that we should not give God's playground, we should not give the suffering territory over to Satan as if he were the head of the church, the head of the playground. We should respond in playful terms with someone who would dare, who would dare hurt the life of a spirit-indwelt soul. And among the playful exercises that Luther employed in his um, theological journey, he believed firmly that Christians should very often and consistently taunt the devil whenever the devil accuses him of sins. In such moments, Luther said that if the devil were to offer him a list of his sins, that we should retort that the devil's list is not complete. <laughs> is that all you got? Bring more. When a Christian feels attacked by the devil, Luther had all sorts of unique suggestions on how to play the devils, how to play with the devil. If necessary, he said that you are, when you are tempted by the evil one, you need to be among friends, and in those friendly journeys and those interactions, we should do everything we can to discuss all sorts of irrelevant matters. For example, the latest news in Venice, he says. <laughs> When persistently feeling attacked, Luther urges the sufferers to seek convivial company, the kind that has been abundant here in these last few days, to dine, to dance, to say, to come with all sorts of jokes, and to sing together. All the things we'll be doing this week here at Music Camp here. When the devil sought to accuse Luther, he believed the best tactic was to avoid his game and employ his time in other games among friends so that we were to immediately, when feeling tempted, to join the company of others and begin to do those things, those common things that make us who we are as Christians. But perhaps the most striking element of Luther's play theology was the role of singing and how it shaped the home and the community here. It's very hard uh, to contemplate the home life of the German reformer without considering the effects of his jovial and pugilistic nature all at once inside his home. Luther's theology of play was not assigned only to difficult cases or extraordinary theological dilemmas. For Luther, the home was one of the primary places for play and leisure. And Luther's leisure practices at home shed all sorts of interesting light on his own temperament, including his humor and cheerfulness, and his profound distaste for his theological opponents. For Luther, music was everywhere. And for him, it was how God revealed himself most clearly in his word. So if you want to see how God reveals himself in his revelation, you must see God as a God who sings. Music was how God played best. And the home was the place of play and leisure because the church provided true play and leisure to the saints. Uh, as you all know, Luther had a great love for hymns and his great admiration for the place of music in the life of the church. Indeed, I argue, that one cannot understand the man Luther without grasping the significance of music for his theology. While Luther affirmed that music takes the highest place of honor after theology, we should also consider the role of music as play in Luther's theological repertoire. That is, hymns did theology at its best for Luther. Congregational singing had this play-like rhythm, because for Luther, congregational singing was meant to be popular. The church should sing hymns, and the hymns should be the expected background music to revolutions. If we are to change society, music must follow. Uh, in a very interesting article by a very interesting man, Klaus Kramer, entitled How Martin Luther Became the First Christian Pop Star, <laughs> he notes that Luther's hymn was the surest way to get rid of Catholic priests in local churches and start a new Reformation one in its place. He writes about a church in Schweinfurth where the priests uh, had no interest in following Luther's theology, and the congregation in the middle of his homily began to sing, A Mighty Fortress in our God, is Our God, and then they went all into the streets of Schweinfurth, and they began to sing out there as well. And two things happened almost immediately the priest ran away, and a new Reformational church started in town <laughs> almost overnight. 
The German reformer composed more than 38 hymns, numerous arrangements, including service music for church use. Uh, Spangenberg, a Luther music scholar, writes that Luther's hymns are lovely and hearty and cheering and comforting. And I love all those words put together. There is a deep playfulness in Luther's hymns fit for Christians who wish to do warfare against the devil and Kamala Harris. <laughs> Luther's remarkable workload finds rest in his completed compositions and relentless desire to see sacred music transform the worship of the church. If the wisdom of God plays with the world he created, then music serves as one of the primary instruments of conveying the joyfulness of God. It was integral in Luther's life, not only the church, as I said, but also at home, where he brought hearty singing to the life of all of those who entered in it. Uh, a good friend of mine from uh, Ligonier Ministry, Stephen Nichols, writes this here. He says that it was not unusual for guests at the Luther home to be treated to a concert by the Luther family right after dinner. L music was God's tool to bring solace to Luther amidst all the many controversies around him. And we, one might even estimate that were it not for the role of music in Luther's life, he would have died years prior to when he did. But music also provided him an opportunity to pause from his academic pursuits and enjoy the goodness of God in the sung word. Singing was God's way for Luther to bring rest and refreshment to our imagination. The act of singing to the Lord was one of the most significant ways to express our human gratitude to the God of song. It served to make man happy and to drive the devil away by making merry the hearts of the saints and offering rest for the weary. Luther enjoyed the lute as his favorite instrument, and he used it to compose many of his pieces. According to a friend, Luther could never tire of singing and discussing music. He observed that God uses the medium of music to communicate grace to his people, and his magnificent summary of Psalm 46 is a bit of that, which is kind of an autobiography in many ways. He begins with a mighty fortress, but moves to mortal ills prevailing, and he seeks for God while fighting the ancient foe. Luther's legacy of music to the church as a testament to God's playfulness with his children was not a negation of pain and suffering, but the irrevocable reality that though, may kill, though they may kill the body, the truth of God abideth still because his kingdom is forever. God does not abandon, abandon his saints to the devil's playground, but brings them close to his rest where there are joy and peace and song. All theology, uh, said Professor John Frame, all theology is pastoral theology, which means that developing music in the home and music in the church requires a kind of sophisticated playfulness. Children play, that is true, but children must grow from glory to glory, which means that their playfulness doesn't lose its vigor, but it gains in maturity. When my when my three-year-old child goes around the house uh, singing his favorite song, Look ye saints, the sight is glorious. You heard that one? See the man of sorrows now. It's a lovely hymn. What I expect from his singing is not a full, uh, a full mature analysis of the ascension of Jesus, but a desire to grow into ascension knowledge. And so what does he do as he sings at home? What he does is he incorporates ascension singing into his Lego building experience. <laughs> and pastorally, I think this is key here, that our playfulness should not be divorced from our situational and existential perspectives. We playfully sing into our daily rituals of work and rest. There must not be a dichotomy. We, not only, we should not only sing in our rest, we should sing into our work. Pastoral theology encourages people to enter into daily communion with God in their singing, which is why, by the way, it is devastating when young men don't sing in our churches. Absolutely devastating. Right. And what I have found in doing this for 13 years is that when you conquer young men, you will conquer their families, which is why I have this habit because, in case you're just a parishioner here, pastors see everything from the pulpit, right, Steve? <laughs> we see everything and everyone and everything that is happening. And after the service, I have the habit of approaching every young man that I did not see singing throughout the service. 
And I approached them and I asked them, why were you not singing? Oh, I, I, I didn't know. I just didn't know you were watching. Oh, I am watching. <laughs> I am watching. And they know. And the next week, they are more self-aware. I can trust me on that one. And it's a remarkable thing to me when I officiate weddings wherever it is in the country. I look out to the witnesses in the congregation, and I don't know if you've noticed the same thing, but I probably count only half the people singing through some of these classic congregational hymns for weddings. And the reason that is because there is no expectation of singing in sacred events. I have gotten some of the strangest looks in my entire life as I'm leading music in weddings here. There's no expectation of singing in sacred events. And I think by and large, for a host of reasons, pastors have made the process of singing to be an optional part of human engagement. We don't play because we are not told to by the clergy. Um, by the way, you should, if you get a chance to YouTube um, Luther's Wedding Festival, which is a practice that started in the 90s as a way of celebrating Luther and Catherine Van Boro's wedding. It's fantastic. It's filled with laughter and dancing, fitting to a theology of play. I love what they did there. So pastoral theology sees music as an integral part of our playfulness. We sing to our children before they go to bed, and we should sing as a way of bringing rest to the weary. God's playground is not just a place for laughter in good times, but a place for God's goodness to shine through in times of need. Music, especially congregational music, needs to be presented in the context of good gifts. This is a good gift to you. Uh, we've been doing uh, psalm roars for 13 years in our, in our congregation, and I refer to psalm roars as our favorite altar call moment <laughs> because it's our opportunity to draw people to Jesus, to draw them to something strange that by the time they leave, they're refreshed and, and worn out as if they had just played for an hour, which is exactly what we're doing. Music must be fun, and it must push us to maturation. Like any ordinary playground, what happens there is you develop coordination, you develop strength, you develop flexibility, but all in the context of recreation and pleasure. Good musical playgrounds urge the people to join other voices and desire that good thing that they didn't think they needed before they experienced it joyfully. It's interesting as you read through the Psalter, that the psalmist doesn't merely give a mechanical call to shout to the Lord, but he sets a playful mood to the singing, doesn't he? Shout how? Joyfully to the Lord. The entire ethos of singing carries with it a playfulness that should take all of you from Sunday to Sunday to Sunday. Pastoral theology is the beginning of all good play. It encourages the church to see singing, not just as a decorative piece to the furniture of ecclesiastical gathering, but a fundamental means to communicate, to relay, and to play with the Lord our God. Luther began a frontal assault upon the church of the day, and at the heart of his assault was releasing the kraken of playfulness and restoring the church to its proper place in culture, a place where young and old joined forces to taunt the devil and play day and night singing the songs of Zion. Thank you. Amen. What time is it? It is 9.38. Okay. If anybody has questions, i got about two minutes. Yes, sir. Uh, What's your name? Peter Johnston. Good to meet you. Nice to meet Good you. Good to meet you. Facebook friends. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, delight. Uh, Robert Bella in uh, his book, uh, Religion and Human Evolution talks a lot about um, kind of comparative religion and explores the development of different kinds of religions uh, across culture over time. But he uses the category of play wow. as uh, a central category for the understanding of all religiosity. Um, and so, I mean, I'm just thinking on my feet here in interaction with your with your um, conversation. But I wonder if there might be ways to Two, to, to think about the liturgy itself as a kind of playfulness uh -huh. uh, and and then you know to push the theoretical question further it'd be really interesting to consider <laughs> what are the distinctive Christian components or Christian uh, 
what's implied in the way that we worship that shapes our understanding of play relative to others. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, that's that's fascinating. Um, my my only contribution to that analysis there is I think about uh, Presbyterian forms of worship. I have attended Presbyterian churches for a couple decades now. And where they remove the element of playfulness is in their desire to over-explain everything. <laughs> and when you over-explain liturgy, you take, it's as if somebody were in the playground and somebody had to introduce everything that you were about to do. Right. That would be tedious. It would take away the joy of playing. And I think that's one area where we need to be very cautious that we don't attempt to over-explain. I mean, I attended a lot of churches in my lifetime when I'm on vacation, and that is a very prominent thing. Every element of worship needs to play. Well, play doesn't flow if everything needs to be interrupted with a word or 100 of them. And so that's, a, that's excellent. I would love to follow up with that, Peter. That's fantastic. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Set up.